The largest mountain in the world is probably known to everyone, i.e. Mount Everest, at more than 29,000 feet. 1% of the people that attempt to climb it die. But did you know that there's another mountain where 20% of the climbers always end up dead? Yes, K2 is the second tallest mountain in the world. Today, we'll discuss a terrible disaster in 2008 on this savage mountain in light of Wilco Van Royen's story. Before we discuss the incident, let's understand why K2 kills every fifth climber. Even though it's slightly shorter than Everest, it grapples with worse high altitude challenges. Beyond 26,000 feet, climbers enter the notorious death zone, where their cells start deteriorating. The journey to K2's base camp is no walk in the park, as it involves navigating through snow, ice, and rocky terrain. This is no mountain for leisurely tourists looking for a picturesque Instagram post at its peak. It's an endeavor suited for the well-off, not just your average businessman seeking a scenic hike. At a precise altitude of 26,000 feet, K2 climbers encounter a bottleneck. At this point, a person has only about a third of the oxygen available compared to at sea level. Climbing this bottleneck means facing quite threatening circumstances because this is the height at which planes normally fly, and the mountaineers must face up to 60 degrees of steepness of the mountain. The tragic incident that occurred on K2 in 2008 was directly linked to this bottleneck. The optimal window to ascend K2 is technically between June and August, yet bad weather thwarted attempts in both June and July of 2008. Around 10 groups of climbers were held up, waiting for a weather break that seemed to be coming on August 1st. Certain groups reached Camp 4 on the day prior to July 31st and collaborated for a joint summit attempt August 1st. These teams included members from various countries, such as an American team and a group of high altitude workers from Pakistan. Among them, Shaheen Bey held the most experience as a high altitude porter having previously summited K2 in 2004. Unfortunately, he had to descend due to severe altitude sickness. His expertise and leadership were sorely missed. Taking charge of securing ropes for the final ascent, the high altitude porters and a team of South Korean Sherpas inadvertently positioned the line too low on the mountain, just above Camp 4, where they were unnecessary. As a result, they ran out of rope closer to the bottleneck, where they were crucially needed. Departing for the summit at 3 a.m., climbers soon realized the error and had to reposition the lower ropes above the bottleneck, causing significant delays. Several climbers, including Dr. Eric Mayer and Swedish climber Frederick Strang, made the wise decision to turn back, recognizing that the conditions weren't favorable for a safe ascent and return. Some continued until 8 a.m., turning around but tragically stuck again as climbers approached the bottleneck and entered the death zone. While passing another climber, Dren Matic lost his footing and fell 300 feet to his death. Despite Serbian hikers' efforts, he died. French Hap, Jaya Beg, and Frederick Strang helped Serbian climbers return Matic's body to Camp 4. Some climbers lost their footing and started sliding. One fell off the mountain since an ice axe wasn't being used. And after a tragic slip and slide down the mountain, he lost his life. Two fatalities caused lengthy delays, resulting in a bottleneck and prompting the mission to be abandoned and all climbers to return to Camp 4. Wilco states that during the daylight, when they were fixing the rope, one man fell down. Wilco Van Rugen called this a really stupid accident, stating that such accidents are not supposed to happen on K2. People are not used to climbing these technical parts. Everest you can climb without technical experience. Here you have Camp 4, then snow, and then the bottleneck, and then a very technical traverse at altitudes of 8,200 meters. Nonetheless, a considerable number of climbers persisted, evidently propelled by a resolute desire to reach the summit. Nicholas Rice, guided by his gut feeling, chose to turn back, saying, someone had just died on the path I was trying to climb. Recognizing the ropes were improperly set up, he didn't want to take unnecessary risk. K2 is already a formidable challenge, so there's no need to make it even tougher. Despite the sequence of unfortunate events and the late hour, a notable portion of the climbers pressed on. Most reached the summit after 8 p.m., well past the usual 3 to 5 p.m. window. Spanish climber Alberto Serrain was the exception, reaching the summit and returning without problems. 
he left early and reached the peak by 3 p.m. For the remaining climbers, the descent was dark and dangerous. As the Norwegian group approached the bottleneck, a Ciroc fell from above, severing the fixed line and killing Rolf Bay, who had turned back 300 feet short of the summit. The rest of Bay's group, including his wife, returned to Camp 4. With the ropes gone and ice chunks everywhere, most would struggle to navigate the bottleneck. For those who remained at the bottleneck, fear set in. A few courageous souls attempted a descent in the dark without proper ropes or safety equipment, relying on the assistance of Sherpas, who were heading to the peak the following day. Their efforts helped some of the climbers return to Camp 4. Either way, more lives were lost. Ives de Bach, a 61-year-old French climber, had previously attempted K2 twice and was making a final attempt. He chose to descend into the darkness, and the combination of oxygen depletion and urgency proved fatal. Kaz van de Gevel, another climber who opted to descend, witnessed what he believed was a fellow guide's fatal fall. The tally had reached four lives lost, and sadly, that was just the beginning. Around eight climbers were still above the bottleneck, but they were faced with the predicament. The broken Ciroc had taken away the fixed ropes that they needed. They chose to make camp. The following morning, Dutch climber Wilco van Rugen noticed his vision deteriorating. According to him, this immediately resulted in a decision to make his way down. According to Wilco, he was on his way back from the summit and was there at 7 p.m. in the evening, which was much too late for him. It was completely dark, so he decided to spend the night above the bottleneck and then traverse. Wilco never managed to witness the accident that followed. However, Van Rugen saw a group of three climbers, possibly two Koreans, and their guide, Sherpa Dawa Tenzing, tangled in a rope and hanging from a ledge. Miraculously, they were still alive. It's not clear if Dawa was part of the group, but it's been said that all three of them were Korean. Before continuing his descent, Van Rugen could only give them an extra pair of gloves. Clearly, their life depended on it. On their descent, they crossed paths with two other climbers, Gerald McDonald from Ireland and Marco Confrontola from Italy. Confrontola recounts their effort to free the stranded climbers. However, McDonald began ascending the mountain seemingly in a state of high altitude sickness induced delirium. Despite Confrontola's hour-long struggle to free the Korean men, he couldn't succeed. Confrontola was still making his way down when an avalanche struck just above him. He later reported seeing McDonald's body in the avalanche debris. Conflicting reports emerge as survivors recounted their experiences. Van Rugen believes McDonald's ascent was driven by a desire to aid the stranded climbers, even after Confrontola had descended the mountain. However, the truth remains somewhat uncertain in this regard. Subsequent accounts support the photos taken by Sherpa Himba Galeji suggest that McDonald did indeed attempt to rescue the trapped climbers. Regardless of the specifics, McDonald never descended the mountain. The death toll continued to rise due to the avalanches and Serik Falls. With the exact number unclear, Karim Hyatt, a Pakistani climber, lost his life in another Serik Fall above the bottleneck, marking the sixth fatality in that area. Subsequently, a massive ice fall swept away five more hikers, including the trio that had been entangled. Regrettably, even the Sherpa who ascended to assist with the rescue was among the deceased. This catastrophe raised the death toll to 11, constituting the deadliest single accident on K2. The positioning of the fallen climber's body indicated that they had been freed from the ropes before their demise. This collaborated the accounts provided by Van Rugen and Pimba regarding the sequence of events. While Van Rugen survived, he lost all his toes, a miraculous outcome considering the circumstances. He joined the select few who managed to survive two nights in the unforgiving death zone. Tragically, 11 climbers lost their lives, far exceeding a reasonable expectation. In a rescue operation launched on August 4, 2008, the Pakistani military utilized two planes to save some of the remaining climbers. According to Wilco Van Rugen, the primary challenge was their inability to locate Camp 4 in the darkness. He mentioned that they descended in the dark due to their late start to the summit. The delay in reaching the summit was caused by the high number of people attempting to ascend. Despite time lost, rope repairs, and the devastating loss of Trenmandy, the original plan should have been abandoned. Nevertheless, 
Many persisted in their climb, even as the death toll mounted. Ultimately, 11 lives were lost, a nearly miraculous figure given the dire circumstances. The victims hailed from various countries, France, Ireland, Korea, Nepal, Norway, Pakistan, and Serbia. The aftermath of the 2008 disaster left a lasting impact. No one managed to summit K2 in 2009 or 2010, and some who attempted it perished, including Swedish climber Frederick Eriksson. What do you think went wrong? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below. For similar content, don't hesitate to explore some of the other videos on your screen. Have a great day.